So one night I woke up and it was just a couple of years ago, maybe five years ago, if that. Hmm. And I thought one of, there were three children standing beside my bed. They weren't children, they were adults, but my kids are all adults. So I thought it was my kids. And I said one of my kids' names out loud, hey, so-and-so, what's, I don't want to say his name, but what's going on? What are you guys doing? And then realized they don't all live at home. A few of them did, but not all of them. And there were three of them standing there. And so I'm like, I hit my husband. I'm like, hey, and said his name. Hey, wake up, look at this. And my husband is in a sleep state where I cannot oh rouse him. I can't hit him hard enough to get him to wake up. I can't do anything to get him. So I turned back to them and I realized these are my children because they look similar enough that my first thought was that it was one of my other kids. But then upon waking up more fully and looking at them more closely, they were too short, they were too stocky. Their eyes were almost just black, vacuous and bigger than normal human eyes. Their skin was a bluish, had a bluish tint to it. And the space around them seemed very dark, almost like there was just darkness surrounding them, which is a weird thing, especially behind them. And I, they just, they stared at me and they spoke to me, mind speak, not, not audibly, but mind speak. And I said, what are you doing? And they said, come with, they said, you have to come with us. The one in the front said, and and I just felt this evil coming off of them, palpable and evil. Time is ticking away. Welcome to the Strange O'Clock Podcast with Michael and Jerry. Join us on an extraordinary journey into supernatural news from a Christian perspective. Delve into intriguing, sometimes conspiratorial topics that will captivate your imagination. Whether you're a Christian fringe believer or a truth seeker in paranormal phenomena, this podcast is tailor-made for you. Unravel mysteries, share stories, and gain biblical insights into the supernatural. Expand your spiritual horizons and tune in now to the Strange O'Clock podcast for an extraordinary adventure. Hello and welcome to the Strange O'Clock podcast. I'm Michael. And I'm Jerry. And we have our special guest tonight, Karen Wilkinson, the author of Stolen Seed, Evil Harvest. Welcome, Karen. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. I'm so happy and excited to be here with you guys. I feel like we're old friends and I'm already having the best time. So thank you so much for inviting me. Wow. We're happy to thank have you. you here. We're honored and blessed very much to have you on board, Karen. I have been binge watching and binge listening to your podcast for the last six months or so, however long we've been friends. And I just thought to myself, oh gosh, I just can't wait to have her on board Strange O'Clock podcast and ask her questions and, and get her story uh, with us. And, and I know that you tell different angles and shades of your story to every podcaster that you speak to. So we're just so happy that you're on board, Karen. So Karen, could you tell us... <sighs> What inspired you to write Stolen Seed and Evil Harvest? Obviously your experiences, but can we even go further than that, even before that? Was there something in your family that might have opened the door to your experiences, Karen, with these demonic alien abductions? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So that in itself is a very interesting question because I think it is a lot of different things. There was a heavy Masonic background in my family. My grandfather was a high-level Mason. My parents were both in Demolay and Eastern Star for the women. And then I was inducted into Rainbow Girls when I was a young teenager, which was very creepy, I have to say. And so I think there was that. I think there was a there's always there was this family history of these types of things happening. So I do believe the genetic lineage ties into that, the family bloodlines and genetics, specific genetic types that they, these beings are looking for had something to do with it as well. As far as the inspiration for writing it, that um, that really came after I spoke with L.A. Marzulli and interviewed with him for his fourth movie in the UFO series on the abductions. And 
when that came out, I was terrified because I'd never spoken to anyone about this. I never thought I would, but God led me to him. And I felt very strongly about sharing with him and how it all came together was just all God. It was just the way it worked. I, I, I can't even explain how it happened. But after that came out, then I started hearing from other people and I was at another event with him. And so many people came up to me and wanted to share and wanted to talk and wanted to thank me for sharing my testimony. And there was so much more to share of my testimony and God put it on my heart to write and put it strongly on my heart to write. It was like when God puts something on your heart to do and it was day and night nonstop and I had to do, I had to, and I'm like, God, what am I supposed to write? And it, God says, you write the truth and that's easy. So I, that's what I did. And, and, and then here we are, but God really did put it on my heart so strongly. I couldn't not write. It was just, it was every day, all day. That's all I did. <laughs> it was crazy, but it was amazing. It was a blessing. It was cathartic. It was great to get it out. It was great to finally deal with a lot of these things. And I didn't write about everything. I didn't want this book to be scary or triggering to anyone, but I wanted it to show that you're not alone if this has happened to you, that there's a way out of it, and to show what's happening from a Christian perspective, because I couldn't find anything else doing that from an actual abductee's point of view. And so that's why it was really important to me as well. I hope that Thank answers you, that. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank okay. you for beautifully answering that. Thank you. Yeah. So, so for those that are new to your story, I'm sure they're very interested to hear just the rundown and be led of the spirit, how you want to share this. A lot of us have been following the, the abduction phenomena and the concept of the hybrids and all this. And But there's a lot of people listening that are tuning in. Like the people that I met today, I had a really amazing, wonderful, miracle-filled day in this little town in North Carolina, getting to share the Strange O'Clock podcast with people and get into, yeah, can I get a deposit for the blah, 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 for the thing? for the. And by the way, we're going to interview Karen Wilkerson today, and she's been abducted oh. by aliens and talked about it. And they're just the bank ladies. <laughs> anyway, bye. Don't forget to yeah. listen to Strange O'Clock podcast. And for those people... Also, I, I think it's great that you share the gospel message in your book, too. So that being said, why don't we start from the beginning and just feel free to just be led of the spirit as you share and can't wait to hear the whole story. Okay, sure. The book is really my story and my testimony of the things that have happened to me for my entire life from as young as I can remember. But around that is explanation and definition and information about who and what these beings are and how I came to those understandings and sharing enough information so that it's not just a book that says, this is an alien objection. This is what happened. The end it's these things happened and here's where I feel they came from. And here's the history and here is how it ties into the biblical timeline and here's how it ties into scripture and here's how all of it helps make sense and in that aspect it's not just sharing a unusual phenomenon something that is strange and interesting and dark at times but it's taking it a step further and saying this is why it's happening and how it's happening and how you can stop it and looking at it through a Christian lens as well as to the explanations for what they are and how they got here. So that's the high level of it. And the book is a pretty high level view too of a lot of it. I didn't get into, there are details, there are detailed scenarios and stories and accounts in here of things that have happened. But some of it's very high level as well because I don't think some of the gory details of these things are going to help anyone in any way, but just offering up something that lets people know they're not alone, offering something for other people who've been through these things or know someone who has been through something like this, or are curious about this because they're getting interested in it, but they're not quite sure because it feels a little new age or it feels a little dark or they question their Christianity when they're looking into it. So I wanted it to be something that's supportive and comforting 
And at the same time, making it okay to have a conversation about these things that some people quite frankly call crazy. Those of us who've been taken and had these experiences have been called by other Christians and other pastors. We've been called delusional. They've said that these are just psychotic delusions. These things didn't happen. And to me, that's victim shaming because when someone takes the time and has the courage to share this Absolutely. Kind of story, they're looking for love and compassion and support, not to be told that they're crazy. And we're not crazy. We all have the same story. So many people have come up and said, I could have written exactly that. I had the, these, they were mirroring each other. And it's so many people. You would be amazed how many people. I hear from someone every day when I go to conferences, dozens upon dozens of people, sometimes hundreds come up and want to talk about their experiences. Attention podcast enthusiasts and believers in independent media. Donate to our Strange O'Clock podcast with Michael and Jerry to support our growth and independence. Your contribution covers expenses like web hosting, design, editing, and upgraded equipment. By supporting us, you foster quality Christian content that challenges secular media and draws people to Jesus as evidenced by the messages and reviews we've received with gratitude. Our unique perspective embraces a supernatural worldview, offering fresh insights. Your generosity means the world to us. Together, let's make a difference in the media landscape. Join us on this extraordinary journey. Go to strangeoclock.com. And there needs to be more of an openness so that it's not just someone like me that is there to talk. There need to be more people that are willing to talk about it. And so I'm hoping that in the Christian community that this starts conversations as well and not just keeps it out in some kind of a woo universe. People like L.A. Marzulli have been groundbreaking in getting these conversations going. And I want to keep those conversations going. That's awesome. Karen, what was the first or one of the first episodes of your harrowing alien abduction uh, when you were a little girl? And I know that you talked about it in in detail uh, with some other folks and such. Can you turn it back the hands of the clock back to when you were whatever, how old, four, five, six, seven years old. And what happened that first time, if it's okay, if I ask. Oh, absolutely. No. And that's what this is about, making it okay to talk about these things and sharing these stories so people can understand what it's like if it hasn't happened to them, but maybe someone they know as well, or maybe something's happened and they didn't realize that's what it was. But I can't even remember the first time because it happened for as long as I can remember, from as young as I can remember. And I know, and I've told the story before, but I know on when I was really young, like probably three years old, I was so scared of my father's, some of my father's family members because they were tall and thin and blonde and fair eyed and they looked like these Nordic entities. And at that point I was so little, but I was already afraid of how these things looked and a little child, a three-year-old can't make that distinction that these were humans and those weren't. I just knew that I was afraid of them. So that was as early as I can, that was very early on. And, but when I started remembering the actual abduction experiences, I was probably five or six years old and a typical experience would be middle of the night when I would wake up and just, I would feel a difference in the room. there's just a feeling you get. It's that sense of dread, that sense of evil. You can feel it around you. You can feel it in the air. Sometimes it would get really quiet. If there were cicadas and crickets outside, they'd go quiet. Mm. Sometimes there's this weird low hum that would go from low to lower. And it's just the creepy noises that aren't normal. And sometimes there would be a light that would come through the window. Sometimes I would see a really bright light. And then Normally, there would be a few gray entities in my room, in the corner or at the foot of the bed or beside the bed, somewhere in the room, and usually two to four of them. I never saw less than two at a time. There were always at least two. I thought that was weird. But And they would, at that point, put me into a state of usually sleep paralysis, where I was fully awake and fully aware, but but I couldn't move. More like paralysis Mm -hmm. even than sleep paralysis, quite honestly. When they would levitate me off of the bed, 
And at that point, wow. yeah, it, and you just, everything just goes numb. And I would just, mm. it was like, just be floating. And um, they would float me up through a ceiling or out a closed window. And I know that doesn't make sense, but we're dealing with entities that are working with, with information that we don't have physics that we don't have, understanding that we don't have. They're so far advanced. The funny thing about the window and the ceiling is that going through it, it was almost like my body was vibrating, but not, it's very hard to describe. It was almost like it was, I could feel my body go into a thousand million little pieces. Oh. And oh, wow. Once I got out of the house, sometimes I could remember seeing rooftops and trees and things like that. Most of the time at that point, they would put me into a sleep state. Quite often, I would just wake up on an exam table somewhere. Many times they took me, I would wake up when we would get to these elevators. The elevator, it was always so cold. <laughs> I just always remember being so cold when I was little. And I would... Oh grab my blanket. I had this little blanket and I called it cold blankie, not because it was Ooh. cold, but because I would go to sleep clutching it because I knew I was going to be cold. And I wanted that blanket in case they took me that night because it would help me stay warmer. And that's why I called it that. <laughs> and nobody understood why I called it that. But to me, it made sense because I was just a little kid. Mm -hmm. I would wake up and there would be these elevators we would get in and they went just down and down and down. And that's how I knew oh. I was underground because elevators went down. And then I would get on what I used to call mm. the sideways elevators that went side to side. Okay. And sometimes they would go like diagonally, but clearly those weren't elevators. But at the time I didn't have a, anything to compare that to because cars and trains and things were loud, were bumpy, made noises. This thing was silent. And so it was like an elevator that went side to side. But my guess mm -hmm. is that and this is just a guess that it was like a high-speed train of some sort because it had seats. Like the elevator thing didn't have seats, but when I went in the one that went side to side, it had benches in it. No, not there. Yeah, there are benches. There was, I, I remember some of them have a red leather on them, but okay. yeah, that's a weird detail that I remember from them, but it was dark. Mm -hmm. It really darkly lit and it might've been red lit like it was red lights or something that made it look red okay. I don't know but I okay. I always remember like the red leather pleated leather little details that from when you're little obviously you don't remember all the details but and so from that point super I was important taking... very important those details yeah uh, yeah continue. and it's funny because the little details come back sometimes when I'm talking about it I'm like I always see it in my head but I don't always say it because I, when you're telling a story, I'm not a great storyteller. I'm not great at retelling the things that have happened to me. So when I'm telling them, you are I a lot of details. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're doing great. Sweet. I just don't always think about, oh, yeah. I should share that detail because it's in my head when I'm talking about it, but I don't think about sharing it. We This is a classic. You're sharing a classic UFO alien abduction grays encounter, but that being said, the details then become the most important thing. So as for those of us who are investigating this, your testimony is a, a very, those details are very important in your oh, okay. very important already overall testimony. So please continue. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And when you talk about details, one of the weird things is I always remembered like the ceilings in the houses where we lived, like in my grandma's house, there was wallpaper on the ceiling and the edges were brown and curled, but you couldn't see that from the floor. But when you got really close to it, it was just the slightest brown on the edges and just a little tiny curl. But I could see that when I was up at the ceiling or the little bugs that were in the square. There was a square light cover on the middle of the room. Mm -hmm. And I could see all the like little dead moths and dead flies and dust bunnies and things that were collected in there. And mm -hmm. part of going through this is letting your mind pay attention to other things. So you don't have to think about what's happening because it was scary. And so I would just try to let my mind look at other things, pay attention to other things. Cause I didn't want to look at the grays either. Cause I was terrified of them. They just looked so scary to me. So I'd rather look at anything, but them just the way mm -hmm. they moved, the way they moved their heads, right. the way they had no feet. They were featureless. Their bodies were featureless. Their head, wow. they were just eyes and they're just 
big eyes and they had hardly any other features. Wow. And the way they moved and then they spoke telepathically. Telepathically is a weird word to use because it was more like mind speak. It's not like they could read my mind. They were speaking to me and I was speaking to them, but I didn't need to open my mouth to do it. Anyway, so when we, when I would get to wherever they were, sometimes I would just be on an exam table and they would be examining different parts of my body, sometimes my spine, sometimes just depended on the day, what they were looking at in my eyes, different things, taking samples, blood samples, skin samples, samples of things. I didn't know what they were taking on, honestly. And I didn't know what they were doing. They didn't tell me. They just were doing different ex- things to me okay. using machines that I didn't know what they were. And it's not like they took the time that a normal doctor would do to sit and say, here's what we're going to do next. Here's what we're going to do next. They just did what they wanted to do. And then at some point when they were done, they would, you know, I would be back to sleep at some point during the exam. Usually they would just put me into a sleep state. They had this ability to just cover your eyes or move their hand over your forehead, my forehead, and change the way I feel from scared to happy or in pain to no pain or awake to sleep. They just have so many abilities that didn't make sense to me, especially as a little kid. But eventually I would be back in my bed. Sometimes my pajamas would be inside out or off completely and beside the bed. Or quite often I would pee the bed because I was so scared when they first got there. And that would be cold when they'd put me back on it because I hadn't been laying there in it. At that point, I would just be awake. And a lot of times I would go crawl under my parents' bed or lay at the foot of their bed on the floor because they didn't want me to get in their bed with them. It was just their thing. And I'd crawl under their bed, which was dusty and, you know, dog hair. And then, or there was a rug at the foot of the bed, but it was a bear skin rug. Like it was some kind of an animal skin rug. And I was Mm. allergic to it. And I, I didn't care. I didn't care. I would just lay there and sneeze and until they woke up and made me go back to bed. But anyway, so that was a typical scenario and it happened all the time. If it happened once a week, I think that would be almost average. I think it. there were times where it happened more often in a row and then there'd be a break and then more often in a row and a break, but there was no rhyme or reason to it. I never kept track of it. I just knew it was going to happen and never knew when. And when I was little, I tried hiding. I tried everything I could think of. I tried singing Jesus Loves Me and songs like that. I It wasn't up to me. Someone else had given them permission to take me. So I wasn't able to, but I do think, I will tell you, I do think some of the nights when I sang Jesus Loves Me and stuff like that, they didn't come. <laughs> Yeah, there was a, even there was a song on the TV from, and it was from like a Mormon church or something, which I didn't know what different churches and stuff were, but they had a a song too about, and at the end it said, God is love. And I just, I would, I didn't know anything about God. I didn't know anything about Jesus. We went to church, but we didn't learn anything. We learned about Noah and we learned about Jesus, but we didn't learn anything about the Bible. We just learned about the wall of Jericho and things, but not why and not what, and not about that God had authority and that Jesus had authority. So I just thought they were nice stories, but I knew God was there and I knew he loved me and he always let me know that he did. And, and he always gave me these signs my whole life, even as a little tiny kid, I knew when I was five years old and I saw that on TV that said, God is love. I'm like, whatever's happening. I know God loves me. So at some point it's going to be okay. And Mm -hmm. even then he didn't leave me, even though there was nothing I could do about it. Sorry. This just, I get so emotional when I (laughs) think about how I know I I appreciate even when I was so little, you know, it just, I, when I look back on it, he never left me. God was always with me. And even though someone else had given the permission for that, those things to happen, God was still watching out for me and protecting me in ways that only God could. So even though I couldn't stop it from happening, at least I knew that instead of killing myself or hurting myself to get away from the pain of that, I knew that there was a greater love for me 
And mm-hmm. that's what kept me going because honestly, I've talked to so many people and most of us had a lot of times in our life where we're like, this just isn't worth it living with this kind of thing when we didn't know God in our lives. And so just to have that, God finds a way to interject. And when Satan thinks he's going to yes. win, God still finds these little ways to get in there until you made the choice because I hadn't made a choice to get my life to God yet. I didn't know. I didn't know I had a choice to make like that. So it was, Amen. it was definitely, sorry. No, it was definitely when I think about it, it was such a blessing that I had that coverage even then and that God never left me. Even when I walked away from my walk with him, he was still with me, but that was, that's right. There's a long way around a typical abduction experience, but that's typically what would not typical. And and the fact that these keys of your childlike faith singing very simple songs, but you know how God just is there and we don't know exactly how many of those abductions that he protected you from just by means of you raising that sword but that's such a a testimony for people to teach their kids the bible and how to pray and sing and with the very little that you had and i guess there's a lot of questions i feel like one of them is very practical for the listeners with just small children Mm-hmm. What is what was it that do you think invited that or allowed that to happen? Before yeah. the show, we talked about Masonic, maybe neglect right. things. Like, what do you, we were talking about family, roles of men and women. Right. I think coverings. it's a lot of different What do you think? Things. Yeah, I think it could be a lot of different things because I never, I don't know for sure. So anything I say would be speculation, but somewhere oh. along the line, because we know there are rules in the spiritual and spiritual warfare and and we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and things like that it there are rules that they have to follow as and just like god with job he satan had to have permission to do what he did right. and someone along someone somewhere along the line gave him permission and it honestly it could have even been just the agreements made by our u.s government with things like the the treaties made in the 40s with back in the time of eisenhower and with the Majestic 12 and those types of things where there were supposed agreements made in exchange for technology where they could experiment on humans and animals and things like that. And they were supposed to obviously be reporting on who they took and what, but you're dealing with entities who are going to do nothing but lie and deceive. You get what you ask for with that. But so those permissions really could have come from anywhere. It could have been generational curses. It could have been from the government, it could have been a family member, it could have been a family friend, it could have been someone we never even knew. Who's to say? I don't know. Okay. I'm just curious to see, and the audience might be curious, the house, the situation, were you on a farm? Was this in like the town? Both. One of one of the locations was a family farm down on the river okay. in southern Ohio, and then one location was in a city in central Ohio. A city that was surrounded by Native American, what they called Native American mounds, but they were the ancient oh. Indian mound, the mounds, the ancient oh. earthworks. Yeah. And then the wow. serpent mound was really close to the farm and the one in Peoples, Ohio. Yeah, the, that one. So okay. we were really close to a lot of there you go. Um, things like that as well. And in that area, I have a friend out there now, Reggie, who I talked to, who I met through writing the book she's still out in that area and she said it's still so much high strange high strangeness out there oh. and there always was so okay well wow, karen so thank you so much for sh- sharing your story and uh, as you were emotional about it i was getting <laughs> emotional too uh, just thinking too. about how evil these entities are to pick on A little girl, I guess it's one thing to abduct an adult where they've had at least, I'm I'm sure it's terrifying, whatever age you are, but especially a child. And I I think of uh, Mm -hmm. what the scripture state about, uh, it would be better for a person to have, in this case, an entity to have a a millstone hung around its neck or his neck and its neck and, and flung into the sea. And I really do think that's the reason why these creatures, aliens or whatever are doing this to to young children they really want to corrupt that early seed and to try to 
bring deception to, to cause deception in the young people and what have you. Oh, about your family lineage. We do know that certain aunts, uncles, grandpas, and what have you, grandmas that are in the occult, whether they're witches or Satanists or high level Freemasons, that they make bargains with the enemy and state, well, I will dedicate my niece, my nephew, my daughter, my son, as sick as that is, that lust and thirst yeah. for power is so strong that they'll dedicate a little one oh, yeah. to them because they want that evil power from the dark side. Yeah, that was something I wanted to say. So Karen, oh, okay, this is the question I was going to ask you, Karen. Okay, so when you were little and they abducted you, do you think that they used the time progression technology or the time traveling technologies to where... We had just interviewed uh, Tony Rodriguez, who talked about the secret space program, and, and they abducted him when he was 10, and he served the 20 and back in the secret I just, space program. Somebody else just mentioned that to me, too. It was funny right. to it, talk about that. I don't know anything about it, but go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt your question. Go ahead. Oh, no worries. So anyway, he discussed how they how he served 20 years in the secret space program, and then he was age regressed back by those gray aliens back to age 10. So he spent from age 10 to 30 years old out there in a series called colony mm -hmm. as a I would I want to say like a secret space program soldier and then after 20 years then he was age regressed back to as if time had not even passed right to the very exact second and minute and hour that they took him do you think that that's what happened to you Karen that uh not that you served 20 years there or anything mm -hmm. like that uh but that when you were taken in body mind and spirit form uh the whole all of you there, do you think that they might have done something similar? It might not have been yeah. five years or 10 years, but yeah. might have been two hours or whatever. Do you think right. that they put you right back to the same? I do. I th yeah, I do. I definitely know that there was some form of time manipulation going on because there would just be, I knew I was there and all these things were happening. And and you can't be missing for that long and not have, yeah, in the middle of the night. And especially if they're putting your family members into a state of deep sleep so that no one wakes up, which they definitely do. And I have witnessed that with other people getting put into that state of sleep when I've, there's been an attempt to take me. So I know it's possible that no one would notice that I was gone, but there are also times where I know it was taken in like the middle of the day because all of a sudden I would be back to where I was, maybe sitting in a classroom or sitting outside or in my room. And I would know what was going to happen for the next 15 seconds to a minute or sometimes longer because it was like they put me back back a little bit too early from where they took me and I knew exactly what was going to be said by every like serious deja vu but more because it didn't need to even be anyone around wow. I knew exactly what was going to be happening for the next 15 seconds 30 seconds sometimes a minute or more and I knew that I couldn't do anything I could try to do something there I honestly there are times where I'm like Oh my gosh, I know this is going to happen. Maybe I can stop all things. Um, like uh, somebody getting upset about something or, you know, whatever. But I, I wow. didn't get involved. And I would just, it, and it was overwhelmingly confusing for your mind to go back and loop back through time again. So mm -hmm. generally, I would just sit very quietly or know what I was supposed to say during that time and say, hear myself saying the words, knowing just watching myself catch up to where then I didn't know what was going to happen anymore. Because it, it wasn't like I was, I was still there and in time and everything, but it's just, it's so confusing and strange to your mind when it happens. But right. I don't have any recollection of being gone for any great deal of time. If something like that did happen, I have no memory of it. But I will say I, they were, I was having all these weird bone problems and growth problems where just out of the blue overnight, I had a scoliosis S curve show up in my back and it just came out of nowhere. And the doctors couldn't do anything about it or operate on it because they kept doing all these tests and they're like, 
your physical age and your chronological age don't line up. Your younger chronological, your body is older, phys is not as old physically as you're, as you are. Oh, now, this is important. I had to wait until I was almost 18 to have a vital surgery because my organs were just being squished because the, uh, the curve was, I have old x-rays that show after the surgery, how intense the curve still was and just but they had to wait wow. five years to be able to do the surgery till my growth had caught up to my chronological age enough or that I was to a point where they could do it but my physical age didn't match my chronological age and I'm wow. 57 now and I I look 57 but I did I have always you know felt I've got carded forever I always looked younger than I was you look um, younger than 57. Wise. So, oh, thank you. God bless you. Karen, yes. God no, bless you. Beautiful. Karen, I was going to say, you, we, you do look yeah, great. Go Karen, ahead. Karen, oh my gosh. Karen, I was going to say, so you were talking about how you had de serious deja vu where you, mm -hmm. you thought of, you knew what was going to happen in the next 15 seconds because they brought you back a little mm -hmm. too early or whatever. So that makes me wonder if deja vu isn't a function or a result of time manipulation and yeah. a lot of people don't think that time travel is possible, but I've seen a lot of videos and read a lot of things where I believe it is, especially from you. But anyway, mm -hmm. I, I'm so sorry. Oh. Go ahead, Michael. You were going to say something. Karen, you were going to say something? In that, yeah, in that same vein, when I had my near-death experience, time didn't exist for me, but I'm watching time pass for everybody. And I'm watching all these things happen, but there was no feeling of time whatsoever. There was no time in that realm that I was in when God took my spirit out of my physical body. And so I still had every aware, I was still me and I had every awareness that I have now, but time didn't exist. And there's no way for me to explain to either of you what that feels like, because unless you've experienced it, there's no way to explain it. <laughs> so yeah time is definitely a constraint that we have here that we have on our on this earth and we have for these physical bodies it's something that god created for us and for us as humans i think but it's a very yes. constrictive and restrictive thing and it figures into all of our math and all of our physics and everything else mm -hmm. but if it they have an understanding of time that's so far beyond and outside of anything that we have so it changes everything and how everything works for them as well. So we, everyone tries to put them in this little box that fits into where we live and they don't fit into this little box. Right. It's huge. It's beyond our understanding and our comprehension. So it just to me, it, it's in very inviting to the imagination to what are the kingdom applications of time control or age regression and when we talk about jesus's words that to enter into the kingdom of god you must be converted and become like little children mm -hmm. to be able to experience god i always i like listening not because of the horror and the the trauma and the i've been surrounded by sra victims my entire life and yeah. i don't want to focus on that and I'm sorry that you went through this, but you're offering freedom to people. But what I think about the Bible, what the word of God offers us and your story, you laid some keys down here about age regression mm -hmm. in what you just said. I won't repeat what you said, but mm -hmm. the doctor's reports and these things that are like, wait, time isn't adding up here. That's yeah. fascinating. At the very least, it's it, anybody with an intellect should be fascinated by your story that this is some actual corroborating evidence right. to any researcher regarding this, not really a phenomenon anymore because it's almost becoming like there are so many people that have gone through this. And so right. your story oh. is unique and you, all those little details are important, the bugs and the light bulbs and all of that <laughs> stuff. It's really easy to write the truth and to take, take the time to think about all the little things when it really happens and yeah, my story is, it's not unique. The only unique thing is that I'm talking about it and that I'm sharing it. And that's because God directed me to, because it's a really scary thing to do, but I feel blessed that I've been given this call to do this. And 
that that I'm able to do it. But and the doctors did say not everyone ages at the same rate. We okay. people age differently True. and things like that. But because mm-hmm. we're like, why is that? Why is my physical age not matching up to my chronological age? Oh, some people just age more slowly than others or something like that. I don't know what he said. He was a very old doctor. I think they just create answers for things they don't understand. Or maybe there's a very simple explanation for it. I don't know. But those are the kind of things I put in the book too, that it just kind of help help the reader understand. You know, there's just so much weird, so many strange things happening around this that nobody could explain. So many strange things happening in my life that no one could explain. Yeah. But the time thing is interesting. It is definitely. Thank you so much for sharing. And and even though you say that your story isn't uncommon to us, it's uncommon. And and obviously when it happens to you, it's uncommon. And even though uh, I think in in a way, I think to know that there are hundreds and thousands of abductees from all over the world, uh, Christian or not, or whatever background or belief system they have, is Mm -hmm. I think heartening to to me to know that you're not alone and that you're able Mm -hmm. to collaborate with others who have come to you, who they can't tell their family, they can't tell their friends, they can't tell their church or whatever, and because they're labeled as crazy or though they might've actually been put into the an insane asylum or whatever, because it's not, I don't know the percentage of people that have been abducted, but I'm assuming mm. that it's probably like maybe one to 5% or whatever. But nonetheless, mm. even if it is 5% of the world, it's still legitimate. Their, your story, their story, it's all legitimate. And to be honest with you, when people say, oh, you know, you're, you're crazy, or you're making up stuff or, or whatever accusation, false accusation they come up with. But really and truly, if you come out and say this, there's no, you're not getting fame and notoriety or anything like that. In yeah. fact, you're, you're getting the opposite. You're getting sometimes scorn and ridicule. Um, I, I can mm. imagine even people that have said that have gone to heaven and back and they quickly realize that not everybody's on board with what they have to say. But anyway, so Karen, uh, one of the questions I had was, I know that you mentioned the hybrid children that you had unwillingly oh, yeah. given birth to because right. they had not only abducted you, but impregnated you with their seed and what have you, thus the name stolen seed. And of course, took your hybrid babies. Can, can you go into detail if you feel comfortable with that? Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I write quite a lot about that in the book. And that's where the name of the book comes from, Stolen Seed, Evil Harvest, because these entities, they're taking little children at a very young age and in essence, grooming them to become part of this program. They're teaching us as children at a very young age to be compliant, to be comfortable within these scenarios and situations, to be comfortable with them. I had a handler. It was with me from very early on and throughout the rest of my life as I was being taken. And they're grooming these children to be adapt and agreeable and to be a part of these programs. And They're Mm -hmm. trying to teach these children that, children like me, that they are the good guys, that they would always say to me, you're important, you're special, we need you, you're a very important part of a very important project, you can't tell anyone about this, it's really important that you're quiet, and then they would threaten me, (laughs) and they would Mm -hmm. use me to threaten others as a part of showing them what would happen to their families or loved ones because there were humans there too not just alien entities but you know, not just the non-humans but there were human and ent- people there too working alongside these entities and I don't like I say I've said this before but I don't think these people understood what they were getting into it must be exciting mm-hmm. when you're told you're going to get to be a part of a top secret program and you're very smart and you're very special. So we're going to get you into this program, but you just got to sign all these NDAs and you've got to promise not to talk. You know, they told me I was special and I was part of a special program. And that's how they groom children and keep them going and keep you in it and keep you quiet. So anyway, that just sets the stage, but then they just, they harvest eggs, ovum from women, sperm from men. I've spoken with many men who've had their sperm taken against their will. And then they 
have the ability and I've seen it in these facilities to use a form of ectogenesis, which is a, an external womb, if you will, to help grow these fetuses. But they mm-hmm. initially would implant a fetus using what, I don't know how they fertilized it. I don't know what they used. I don't know what their process was, but they would implant me and I would get pregnant. And I wasn't like I, I was married when it would happen. So I was happy. I thought I was pregnant for real. Went to the doctor, got all my tests done, got my prescription for my prenatal vitamins. Cause back then you had to get a prescription. Sometimes got to hear the heartbeat all the blood tests and everything. Back then you also did a blood test. And then at about the end of the first trimester, I would, I'll go through one scenario. I woke up in the middle of the night. This was the first time. And it was about three in the morning and I just had terrible pain and I was spotting, but nothing had left my body. I hadn't passed anything out like a, so I hadn't had a miscarriage to my knowledge because nothing came out. So to have a miscarriage, you have to miscarry. Something has to come out of you. My then husband took me to the hospital and this was in the eighties. So the hospitals and the doctors weren't communicating like they do today necessarily. And they couldn't find a heartbeat. They did an ultrasound. They couldn't see any baby in my uterus. So they Wow. Did a DNC and there was no fetal tissue. And in one of these times that I had that done, they did a blood test to see if I was actually pregnant before they would go any further. Because I said I was pregnant, okay. but they couldn't find a heartbeat. So they just did a blood test. Maybe you were mistaken. Maybe you weren't pregnant. I'm like, my doctor confirmed it, but they did a blood test, confirmed I was pregnant, couldn't find a baby, couldn't find a heartbeat. Then they just went in and started looking. Because I thought maybe it's stuck in a fallopian tube or maybe it's somewhere else Uh because you're clearly pregnant, but there was nothing. I get a lot of flack for the, when I talk about the missing pregnancies, a lot of people, especially no offense, Michael, but men will be like, babies can be absorbed or Mm -hmm. you didn't know, or you weren't really pregnant or how can you say you were pregnant? If, and why didn't they call your right. doctor? I'm like, what's well, a hospital at 3 a.m.? My doctor's asleep. <laughs> and they didn't ask right. me who that doctor was when I got there because I went in through the emergency room and we hadn't even got to that point yet. But maybe I had, I don't think so though. But so I try to give as many details as I can because regardless, it's I've talked to so many women who've been through this too. And people love to come at us and say, there's no way you were really pregnant. We mourned these babies. We cried for these babies. We cried for the loss. We didn't get to bury our babies. I didn't know what happened. I didn't get to memorialize or bury that baby. I got rid of everything. I had all the paperwork. I had everything. It was too hard. I couldn't look at any of that. I threw away the vitamins. I threw away the paperwork. I got rid of every bit of it because it was just emotionally scarring. I spent a week in bed. I couldn't even go to work. I was just devastated. Anyway, but there was one time when I was taken and they walked me down a hallway and there was, there was a Nordic looking entity. And I do remember at some point too, a gray, one of the taller grays was there too. And I was going, they'd walked me down this hallway and the hallway was aligned with just these aquarium, like things that look like aquariums. And they were just lined up the wall and down the wall so it was like like a um, pet shop I don't know if they do that anymore where they used to have walls full of aquariums and in them were little fetuses of different types and different stages and I don't know if they were human or what they were they looked human some of them definitely looked human and they took me into a little room at the end of the hallway <clears throat> sorry my voice isn't great tonight and at oh, the no, end of the hallway mm-hmm. there were doors on either side and the hallway continued on, but it was something else at that point. And so they yeah. opened one of those doors and it was the size of about a large closet. And there was another woman in there going through what looked like a ritual birth ceremony where she was laying what? on the ground pretending to give birth. And they had her what? little baby there. And then one of these entities handed me a little baby okay, and told me it was a good baby and told me to hold it. And to, and so I, I put the baby up to me and tried to hold, hold it. Its head was really big and its eyes were really large. 
overly large compared to what my babies look like when I had my own babies or my human babies, I guess I should say. And it, the skin was very dark, like almost a purple red, reddish purple color. And I held it up to me and it wouldn't cuddle into me. It was just, mm. it was like emotionless, even as a tiny little thing. It wouldn't wow. move into me. It wouldn't snuggle into me. Like when I've held my babies, I am my video kids, when you hold those babies, they just, they become one with you. And it's the best feeling in the world. This baby didn't even respond to being held close to me. Mm. Um, you know, and I was very upset. And I, I just, I knew I just wanted to I get out of there. But I also mm. wanted to keep that baby. And I didn't write about the part where I wanted to keep the baby because I felt guilty about that for a while. But now I realize that I don't need to feel that way. It was okay to have those feelings because, and I didn't write about this, that part, but I did want to keep that baby. And I told them, I'm like, I want to keep it. I wanted to take it home because I thought if it's half, if it's part me, then there's got to be something I can do here. But I realize now that's not the case, but I still, I wanted that baby. I was very upset when they wouldn't let me take it with me. And then, yeah, I was very upset at the end of that. And I, I then it goes black because I, I was so upset. They must have just put me into a sleep state to get me out of there. Because then the next thing I knew, I woke up in my bed. But that was wow. just very traumatic because I wanted that baby so bad. And I wanted it back too. That's yeah, but I realize now that there was nothing I could have done for that baby, that it wasn't human. And God hadn't, from what I could tell, this is just my mm. assumption but that God didn't give that baby a soul because it wasn't a child that was that and it would be in modern day Nephilim basically. And that's an no, abomination that's, in God's eyes. Okay. But if if you had a child that was part something else, we don't really know what it was, mm-hmm. but it's partly you. So mm-hmm. in essence, your empathy and your connection to that is a beautiful and human thing so everything is complicated we live in a simple oh, so world right like yeah. <laughs> all of us have been through some kind of bad relationship something or other at some point with somebody mm-hmm. this is a it's still like for you i feel like this is still a very human it just shows the love that you have for your children whether or not it was by your will or not it's a kind of like an alien demonic rape thing that's happening right. to a lot of people karen mm-hmm. I mean, and this a lot is of women feel thing. exactly the same way too yes they wanted their babies they wanted to keep them they wanted to try to fix them and make them better and we've all felt that, sure. that there was nothing there that we could do and we felt mm-hmm. bad about that but it didn't change the fact that we wanted them i love my children more than anything i would stand in front of a bullet or a speeding train for them i would do anything yeah for them. And I felt the same way about these children too. Um, But they didn't, when I saw them again, much later when they were, it would have been in about uh, 20 to 30 years later, 25, 30, maybe 25 years later or 30 years later. And they had no empathy, no love, no kindness, no sense of any kind of feelings like that they were just it, they just exuded anger and evil and hate towards me and i wow. wanted to love them still i was excited that they showed up they were not there mm. to love me but they were there to try to talk me into going back and i wouldn't go and they were very angry about that and wait and just you, just evil. for those that may are you talking about the purely alien entities or are you talking about the hybrids Oh. as they grew older because yeah, back I up here back up. yeah the, sorry just, yeah no no it's fine older. so you were meeting me. these babies in their older years so what do they look like when they were older and Let's what see. was the context so it was about 25 years maybe 30 years after that after holding that baby and and i'd had a quite a few of these and then i'd had my own children since then were mixed into their and I've been blessed with my own children and with some others that came to me in other ways that I'm able to call my children as well. And wonderful. Yeah, God really blessed me in that department. I can't I got I'm just so blessed. But but I still thought about these other children. I knew they were out there. I still wanted them. 
I still, if there was a way that I could help them, I wanted to help them. And I prayed about it. I prayed about it. I asked God, please, God, if there's anything I can do, let me help them. Let me have them. Let me take them from where they are, bring them here, maybe. Because I didn't know for sure. I knew my Bible and I knew my scripture, but I just, you never think it applies to you when it's, especially when it comes to something like this. You just, it just felt different. And, and I think God allowed this to happen for me to have the understanding, the closure, and to reiterate what God knew that I know, I knew, but I didn't really know and, until then. But so one night I woke up and it was just a couple of years ago, maybe five years ago, if that. Hmm. And I thought one of there were three children standing beside my bed. They weren't children, they were adults, but my kids are all adults. So I thought it was my kids. And I said one of my kids' names out loud, hey, so-and-so, what's, I don't want to say his name, but what's going on? What are you guys doing? And then realized they don't all live at home. A few of them did, but not all of them. And there were three of them standing there. And so I'm like, I hit my husband. I'm like, hey, and said his name. Hey, wake up, look at this. And my husband is in a sleep state where I cannot Gosh. rouse him. I can't hit him hard enough to get him to wake up. I can't do anything to get him. So I turn back to them and I'm like, oh. and I realized these are my children because they looked similar enough that my first thought was that it was one of my other kids. But then upon waking up more fully and looking at them more closely, they were too short, they were too stocky. Their eyes were almost just black, vacuous, and bigger than normal human eyes. Their skin was a bluish, had a bluish tint to it. And the space around them seemed very dark, almost like there was just darkness surrounding them, which is a weird thing, especially behind them. And I, they just, they stared at me and they spoke to me, mind speak, not not audibly right. but mind speak and because i said what are you doing and they said come with they said you have to come with us the one in the front said and and i just felt this evil coming off of them palpable an evil i had been familiar with because it was the same type of evil i'd felt before whenever those entities would show up in the room and i i and, and it's weird because the evil that you feel that I would feel coming off of one of the smaller grays and the evil that I felt coming off of these entities was very similar and it's different from the feelings I get from all the other alien entities that I've encountered it they have a very similar vibe not to sound new agey but a similar feeling comes off of them anyway <clears throat> it was just evil I could just feel it and I'm like no, I, I can't come with you. And they got much more angry at that point and tried to levitate me off the bed. And I felt myself starting to lift off the bed. And I'm like, no, I'm not going with you. And they're like, you have to come with us. I said, no, in Jesus name, I'm not coming with you. And the second I said Jesus name, my body hit the bed and they were gone just like that and my husband sat straight up and was like what as if I had just hit him and I'm just wow. like now you wake up you know <laughs> but I understood it was out of his control and it was terrifying and liberating and freeing and scary and emotional and a thousand different feelings all at once but I felt like I finally had closure because I could tell from them that there was no good there. They were not, there was no love. There was no compassion. There was no kindness. They weren't happy to see me. They were there to do a job. And God allowed that to happen so that I would have my closure. That okay, can you because describe I have a mother's heart. And I think that was. Absolutely. Important. Can you describe, you said they, they were short. They had dark eyes. Can you describe mm -hmm. anything else about them? Were they, I mean, because at first you thought they were your human children and these were obviously not. These were darker, demonic, hybrid children. Right. Can you describe any other details that you saw? Their facial structure was really similar to my kids' facial structure. My kids, 
have just this part of a facial structure. They don't, especially they start out looking more like me and then as they get older, but you can tell my kids are my kids just by looking at us. And so they had these similar facial structures to my kids, but the eyes were just too big, but they weren't so big that it was knock you back. But I did notice the eyes were definitely larger than my kids' eyes and darker, like almost just black, like almost jet black. But their facial features were really similar to mine, except their skin was, because it was dark in dark in the room, I didn't notice when I first looked at them that their skin actually was almost a purplish, bluish color. I just thought it was because the room was dark that I wasn't seeing their skin tone. And then I realized when I was looking at them more closely, their skin was almost purpley blue. They're, they had a hooded thing around their heads so like a hooded almost a cloak jackety kind of thing on so I couldn't see their hair all I could see was their facial structure their eyes I could see that they had hair but I couldn't give you any details about it because again it was really dark and they were about five foot tall maybe and from I'm really bad at those kinds of averages they were but they were shorter than my kids, but not like short, like the grays, like the shorter grays are, which those are usually around four feet tall. Okay. They had to have been at least five foot tall and they were just, their build was really stocky and chunky. And my kids are all mm. little skinny things when they started out. So mm. th- especially my boys, my boys are real, all still real, except for the one who's in the service. He's pretty he's beefed up now but at the time they were a little skinny things it they're that just wasn't their build so aside from the facial structure that was very familiar to me they had the same shape face that I do wow my kids do too so just immediately and your kids when you see your kids in a classroom or when my kids have been in the military and I'll get a picture of boot camp and there's a hundred kids there I can always spot mine right away not always but mostly if there's a if there's a full face then I can find him so it just I just instinctively knew that they were my children but Aaron you mentioned how they were just emanating malice and evil and and they were there on a mission not out of a child mother love or anything like that it was or or that they longed for you or anything but they wanted to persuade you back and and they were just emanating darkness and when you rebuked them in jesus name they left so Mm -hmm. then that begs the question are they of demonic origin? And I believe that they are. And then there's something that you said in another interview, in several interviews, Karen, where uh, you had seen rows and rows of deflated alien gray costumes or, mm-hmm. or not costumes, but I mean, that you saw yeah. rows and rows of, of deflated flesh suits for, for yeah. these uh, aliens. The and mm-hmm. so the grays, right. <clears throat> and so you, you had said that you believe that that they're inhabited by demons, that they're a flesh suit for demons. Mm -hmm. Could you go into that? And then what is the reproductive interaction that this could possibly, I guess what I'm trying to say is, how could these aliens reproduce in you? So do do you mind if I ask, is it that they they deposited their own sperm or genetics into you, unfortunately? Okay, yeah. yeah. So the greys that that I've seen the empty suits of and the ones that I believe are inhabited by demonic entities. And they could also be inhabited by by AI or even another entity if they wanted. Those are created for it to hold. Yes, the they're there to be like the worker bees. They're the ones that come pick people up. And that evil that I felt emanating off of them, because a demon, as far as my knowledge of what a demon is from our scripture and our extra canonical texts is a disembodied spirit of a deceased Nephilim. And the Nephilim is a progeny of a fallen angelic entity and a human. And these children that I witnessed were essentially a modern day Nephilim, a progeny of a human, me, and a fallen angelic being. One of these what people call alien entities. So aside from the grays, there's these gray suits that can hold a demonic entity. There are many other types of 
alien entities that I've encountered, like the taller, older looking grays. I say they're older looking because it's just a d- descriptive because they have wrinkled skin and they their faces have expressions on them and their eyes move and they're not as frail as the shorter grays that would always come to pick me up. And I think that those gray suits were fashioned after this particular species, probably, because they look a lot like them, only they're clearly a very robust species, not frail like these little grays are. And there are the reptilian entities, which my handler was one. There are the Nordics, which I've seen all throughout my life that look almost human, but larger eyes and pale skin, tall, very tall. A lot of these entities are very tall, which is interesting. They're usually very tall. And then the insect type, like mantis, I think is what people call them, insectolin maybe. I've seen those, but they're always across a room somewhere, always sitting in a corner or sitting across a room sitting not like in a chair but crouched because they had these really long arm leg things that bent and were always watching everybody anyway i believe and it is my belief and this is just my opinion it's conjecture on my part but based on my interactions with these entities that these everything not the grays shorter grays but the rest of these entities are fallen angelic entities These are, angels is a misnomer. It's something we use to describe the other beings that God created besides humans. And some of those beings fell. We know this from our Bibles, from biblical scripture and from non-biblical scripture and just about anyone there. It's in movies, it's in books, it's in literature, it's in ancient scrolls, it's in ancient texts. It's in, in every country and every religious belief has a description of these entities that God created that are not human. I don't think these are entities that live out on some distant Zeta Reticuli Z planet or whatever. I believe that's what these are. These are the fallen. The same ones like that fell in Genesis 6 that saw the daughters of men were beautiful and and took wives of whomever they chose. So to answer Jerry's question, I think what they're not, there are sexual things that happen and there are rapes that happen to me but not for the purposes of impregnating me because those things that they did were more ritualistic and more purposeful for other things. The eggs that they harvested from me were fertilized outside of my body and put back in. That's how that happened. So it didn't, so then I was, I'm not privy to how they fertilized those eggs what their process was. I wasn't brought in on that part of it. I was just a breeding vessel that they used like a farm animal or breeding stock. They didn't treat me with any respect. They didn't share anything with me. They didn't talk about what they were doing. They didn't ask me if I was okay with it or if I wanted to participate. It was just done. But that's how they, so the grays themselves, those little grays definitely don't have any procreation abilities. The ones that the government has admitted to having found, there are reports that they have no lymph systems, no digestive systems, no organs. Clearly they have no external organs. And that falls exactly in line with what I've been saying all along. I've written dozens of papers on the grays that are in different publications. And some of it's in my book about my, just what I've experienced And then coupling that with my research and speaking with other people and what I believe them to be. And, and LA and I, LA Marzulli and I've talked about it at great length. And I think there's a lot of strength behind what I think they are just because it's not just me with other abductees as well. We've really talked to so many people about this and there are a lot of great meaning people out there who have a lot of really amazing thoughts about what the grays might be, but they're just opinions. And these people haven't, spent time Mm. in their presence the way the rest of us have it's just but i don't know nobody knows for sure because no one's sitting down getting all the information it's all just based on what data we've collected and what we've been able to identify okay and just to preface my comment here so Mm lamarzuli.net slash store exclusively Uh you can Mm -hmm. find the book stolen seed evil harvest and we're yes. uh, currently interviewing Karen Wilkinson and 
I'm very honored to talk with you. Very thankful for you just being willing to go and, and share the story over and over again. I know it's traumatic, but for those of us in our audience that haven't heard any of this stuff, which there are people that are new to this coming in every day. So it's important to talk to people as if you're just like, you went to the grocery store and you're talking to the girl at the checkout counter and you're telling her like, Hey, I was abducted. There's such thing as aliens. And then getting into these details, forensic crime scene, because it is a crime scene, what happened to you. And it's important to re recollect this as that is what it was. As any satanic cult abducting a child and doing horrible things to them. These are very exotic, paranormal, alien, highly technological and spiritual rape situations that you are brave enough to stand up and speak many people are not brave enough to stand up and speak and i'd like you to share how you got that bravery but first of all you saw aliens of different species in the same or whatever they are clones who knows they're not zeta reticula i believe right I agree. definitely yeah you've got grays you've got reptilians you've got nordics how do you how does anybody process that but is that was that a normal thing like where you would see you're saying usually the giant bug monster thing was in the corner sitting down or I mean, that's like yeah. most of our audience is going to be like, wait, what? Now there's giant bugs too. Like, was that a normal thing? And it was you just yeah. paint that picture a little bit for us a little bit. Sure. Normally when I was taken, the entities that were um, gathering medical information or doing the tests and things like that on me, were the grays, but not the typical short grays that would come to pick me up. They looked like them, only they were taller and they looked a little older and they had faces that were expressions that had expressions. Their mouths opened and moved, their eyes moved, their foreheads moved. Okay. They had stop they had more robust bodies. You could tell that they actually were more viable entities than the shorter grays. So there were usually the ones working on me. The Nordic looking entities were always around from the time I was little. And they seemed to be very, I don't know what everyone's in really specific jobs were, but they seemed to be more working with people who were not comfortable being even used to seeing these entities. And I hate to say it, but you really do. It's shocking and it's shocking at first, but then you're, it becomes part of your life. And I know that's why they take you as a small child. And as a small child, I was groomed to get used to these things so that it wouldn't scare me anymore because it's something I saw all the time. They would be in the same place. Just everyone had different jobs. So the Nordics would be doing one thing, usually with humans and doing things. And I don't know what they were doing. They didn't tell me. But and there were reptilians who there was one that was with me he was my handler he appeared human to me most of the time but that was like a like a screen cover for what he really looked like and after a certain amount of time and I was very comfortable with him and I had a Stockholm syndrome type relationship with him he showed me his true um, form and he was a reptilian and there were many of those around after that that I saw once I'd seen him and he was beautiful. I, I describe him in great detail in the book because he was absolutely stunning. He not like some slimy, ugly lizard or something like that. His skin was like opalescent almost. It was like jewels. It was incredible. He was beautiful. He was huge, very large. And there were the ones that looked like a praying mantis almost is the closest thing I've heard people say because they have a triangular shaped head with the big eyes and very long arms and legs. And they never saw those up close. But often when I was little, I called them the corner sitters because they would always be sitting off in the corner of a room. Or if it was a round room, they would be sitting off on the other side watching everybody. But you could tell they were important because they were just nobody messed with them. I never saw anyone walk up to them and bug them or anything like that. Oh, that's funny. Bug him. That's like a pun. Um, sorry. Anyway, <laughs> you gotta find the you gotta find the humor. Bad joke. In, yeah, bad joke. <laughs> yes, that you was a good joke. The humor I liked it. In, yes, you gotta find the humor in it. Otherwise, you just cry I all love the time. It. Trust me. And yeah, sometimes it's just it. Yeah, it gets to be much. But anyway, so there were humans as well. There were humans working. They were 
people in what looked like lab coats, like doctors, or there were some that were in like military looking uniforms, different colors of army fatigues kind of stuff. I'm trying to remember, but it was mostly the, the brown ones, like the brown fatigues, not the green. And there were people in these, yeah, I'm just trying to remember what different colors of, because the fatigues weren't like what I was used to seeing when I was little, Mm -hmm. because I'd seen army men and things like that, but they were always green, but these weren't green. And then there were people in really benign uh, beige, like smocks and pants that were just very, almost like scrubs, but not really. But as benign as scrubs are, how they use it in hospitals, so everyone looks the same. There were, so there were different, I didn't know what everybody was doing and nobody shares that information because I was just a tool. I was just a part of their, I was just something they were using. I was just a disposable piece of human flesh as far as they were concerned. And they did utilize me for what could only be described as SRA type rituals and I've tried to talk about that on some of the interviews, but I usually start crying. And after I do, I have a really hard time for a couple of days. So I probably won't start talking about that because I think you're the fourth or fifth one this week. And I just, yeah, it gets to the point that we understand. I know it once I've talked to four or five different shows in a week, I get to that point where the emotion is level and the, the stress level of it is so high and so for that one maybe we could do another show to talk about that (laughs) but i know that i'm not absolutely in a place to talk about it tonight i do write about it in the book absolutely and i do put a caveat before that part of the book for people that says this is what's coming if you're not comfortable with this go ahead and skip this part and i I, because i try to let people know in the book if it's something that might be triggering for someone is that might be a part they don't want to read to just skip ahead because the the purpose of this book isn't to scare anyone or to trigger anyone it's to help it's just offer help and to let people know because all of this is interesting and all the information is interesting and i understand that and i understand that it's helpful too to understand what you don't want to happen and what to look out for because these beings are highly deceptive but you have to be careful that you don't go down this into this black too far. Karen, I had a question. Mm-hmm. I know that in some other other interviews that you've had with other podcasters, you had mentioned that that the aliens are creating these human hybrids or hybrids or hybrids inseminating their seed into you or someone like yourself and and creating these hybrids or hybrids to create an end times army. And I think one of the podcasters had questioned that. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that's what's happening because we believe in God, Jehovah, Jesus, that, and that he's, that God is going to come back and that, and from what the scriptures state that, that at the battle of Armageddon, there's Gog and Magog and all these armies that are marching against the Lord in in their own utility and vanity. So do you believe that they're creating an end times army against the Lord by creating these hubrids? It's a good question. They, we haven't been given any specific information, but I do believe that's entirely possible because the late Dr. Chuck Missler said Satan's outnumbered. He's outnumbered two to one. He's building an army. But the other thing to remember too, is if they're able to create these modern day Nephilim, these hybrids that can pass for humans that, that as Dr. David Jacobs says, are walking among us, then these entities are going to have the ability to lead people astray, to share false information, to share false truths, to say that these are our benevolent space brothers, our cedars, that you need to ascend to a higher level, that you need to do this or that or the other. And and lead people away from the gospel or lead people away from the truth and into a different, into a one world religion or a new world religion or, or a no religion at all and lead people away from God and lead people away from salvation because Satan already knows he's lost. At this point, I believe his goal is to get it back to it was in the days of Noah where everyone was just doing evil all the time and the whole world was corrupt 
and we're getting close to that, it feels, but there are a lot of really good people still, so we're not there yet. And also at that time, you know, where there were Nephilim and that. So if Satan knows he's lost, then I think he wants to take as many of us with him as he can. And every soul that he takes away from God's kingdom is a victory to him. And every soul that that God gets that we help share the gospel with, that's a victory for God. Uh, I'm going to do my part to try to to counteract what I know that they're doing that is so evil and so bad. But to answer your question, yes, I think what kind of army are they building? I think it's more subtle than even the Gog and Magog army. I think they probably have that covered with the ranks of the fallen. But I think these are the infiltrators, the ones that you don't realize, the ones that have snuck in across the border and are, and no offense to anyone coming across the border, please don't get me wrong, but but that have snuck in in, right. in the dark of night and now nobody realizes mm. that these are the enemy in, mm. in the midst of us. And right. like I say this quite often, the bad guys don't announce themselves before they do whatever they're going to do. And these right. are the bad guys and they're going to come across, they're going to try to come across as the good guys, but they're not. And people really need to pray for discernment because the Bible right. does tell us there will be a strong delusion that even yes. the most elect would be deceived. And that makes sense. When some miraculous mm -hmm. being comes out of the sky, people mm -hmm. want a miracle. People want yes. all the lights and the in the magnificent show of magic and the display and all that people love that people eat that up and they'll have them people eating out of their hands. And right, that's a scary right. thought. It is definitely for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So well, anyway, Karen, anyway. Uh, we want to honor your time. And I just, we understand that there is a level of exertion and, coming through this trauma and still getting healing i'm sure and, and oh, yeah. all of us have so many questions but I, we want to do another show i would love to have you on my show fringe radio network.com as well hosting the strange o'clock podcast here strange o'clock.com thank you so much for joining us i just want to really thank you karen and if there's any last kind of wrapping up everything before i just do a final shout out and show people where to get the book and just what is it that drives you, Karen? This is amazing. Yeah. Your force, your strength, your energy to share these traumatic testimonies like yeah. that many times you know, per week. I have it's, it's almost like you just want to go and say, Hey, <laughs> I had some crazy alien abduction things. Read my book, buy it, yeah. support yeah. us. Bless you. Amen. Bye. <laughs> but you're sharing it over it's, and it's over again. Lot. God bless you. Oh, well, thank yeah. you so much. It is a lot. It is exhausting. It is emotionally exhausting, but I could not do this. It, the, oh, I can't do this. God is doing this. I do not have the strength. Amen. This, Praise but God. God is giving me the strength to do this. The only reason I'm walking this walk is because it is the path that God has put my feet on. And I wouldn't be able to do this without him because I look back over the week sometimes and I'm like, wow, God, how did we get through that? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Every morning I thank him the first thing. And I'm amazed because it is emotional and it is a lot. And it's like when we start one of these interviews, God takes over and, and I know he's got me through the whole thing and it's going to be fine. And he protects me somehow through it. And it's amazing. Amen. I wouldn't be able to do it without God. And I'm doing it because of that. And because I know that as long as there's somebody out there who this is still happening to, that maybe I can reach and say, Hey, if you call on the name of Jesus, they have to leave you alone because Amen. he has the authority over them. As long as there's still someone out there that needs to hear that, I'll keep doing this. As long as there's breath in my body and it's what God wants me to do, then I will keep doing it until God tells me to do something else. And then I'll do that <laughs> because I have learned that when God tells you to do something, you do it Amen. and it's important. Right. That's why I'm doing it and I'm doing this. And I am really grateful for every bit of it because it has been very rewarding to me just the people that i've bet, gotten to meet like the two of you and to pray with people like the two of you and the people who've reached out to me through my website and just want to share their stories and i get to talk to people like that like my uh, new friend reggie hi reggie and just i talked to the other day and just people like that it's just it's been amazing and it's been That's a awesome. journey 
of the heart that I wouldn't give up for anything. So yeah, that's, that's awesome. And Ellie thank you Marshall so much. Lee and his wife, Peggy, who are the best friends anyone could ever have in the whole world. So Aww. there's that too. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Oh. Amen. Go ahead. Thank Sharon. you so much, Karen, for oh, sharing no, your you. testimonial. You. We appreciate you and your story from the bottom of our hearts. And, and we're just grateful that you have that courage and bravery to step forth and, and almost tirelessly. So even though it's emotionally and physically taxing to share these stories from when you were young. And I can empathize because I'm uh, starting to write a book about my life. And that's something that the Lord has placed in my heart for years. Oh. And I almost feel a little reluctant to revisit some of the more difficult aspects of my life because as once you start writing about something or once you start talking about something, it's almost like you're reliving it in a way. And so I, I give you a major kudos and hand clap and thumbs up for doing that. And I, I thank the Lord for you and all the people around you that, that have lifted you up, really promoted you in your story and how you and your testimonial is reaching hundreds, if not thousands of people who are coming out and sharing how they've been abducted and what has happened to them. I'm really thankful to Jesus. I'm thankful to God for you, Karen. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Those are beautiful words that you said. Thank you. And I'm very excited that you're writing a book. I cannot wait. I, oh, want, I, to be on the, I want to be on the pre-reader list. Oh, thank you. Think about that. Uh, yes. I, I appreciate that. that. So thank you. Do you want me to share where everyone can find me? Yeah. or do you Yes, me please. To... Okay. You can find me on social media <clears throat> and I'll start with my website. My website is my name, Karen Wilkinson author.com spelled with eyes. And I'll share you all this for the show notes as well. You can, the book is available exclusively right now at lamarzuli.net and that's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-I.net. So lamarzuli.net forward, forward slash store for the store. And you can find me on Facebook and Instagram under my name, Karen Wilkinson on Facebook, Karen Wilkinson author on Instagram. And I keep links to all of our interviews there. As Gerilyn knows, we're good friends on Facebook too. So you'll see yes. us. You'll see us on each other's pages. So that's always, it's always good to share with each other. And yeah. And if you want to get in touch with me, there is a page on my website where you can send me a message and I will get that through my email. And I do get back to everyone. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time, um, depending on how many messages I have and what what's going on at that time. But I do get back to everyone. So if you want me to get back to you, just let me know and tell me how you want me to reach out to you. And I will. And yeah, that, and I'll give you all that for the show notes. That's so awesome. yeah, for anyone who has a story to share and you just want to share it with someone, I'd love to listen. So I'll definitely put that in our show notes. Your <clears throat> book is on lamarzuli.net. And yes. by the way, I went to karenwilkinson.com. It's not Karen Wilkinson folks. That's, it's actually karenwilkinsonauthor.com. Right. And There's I'll, I'll put else. that right. <laughs> There's another Karen the Wilkinson who spells yes. her name like mine. So I'm thinking of trying to utilize a different, I have a couple other domain names saved down. So I might switch it up a little bit just to make it easier for people and come up with something a little easier. So I will let you all know if I get to that over the holiday break. I get a nice awesome. week to do that here. So we'll see. I, that's great. <clears throat> I appreciate your friendship on oh. air as well as off air on Facebook and everything. Likewise. And um, I really appreciate you. And so thank you so much, Karen, for Absolutely. appearing as, a, as an awesome guest on our show. And just so glad that you're getting the message out there. And I would love yes, to come back with you. you guys anytime you let me know. Absolutely. I love you both. You have been just the most amazing people. Oh, I we love like you I, too. I feel like I met old friends today. You really... I, we Amen. didn't even want to start Hallelujah. because we were having too much fun talking. Let's make it a habit to get together anytime. So just let me know. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'd love to have you back. You. It's okay. our pleasure and honor and joy for sure. Likewise, my honor too. Indeed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you everybody for joining us. This is Michael. And I'm Jerry. And, and we're so happy to have had this amazing conversation with Karen. And uh, you can find her, all of our contact info and all the ways that you can donate to us too on strangeoclock.com strangeoclock.com 
and we're on a journey to bring the truth to the people that are still just ex asphyxiated i say asphyxiated like they're just like joking on the darkness and bring things back to the cross the gospel salvation in light of with the consciousness of what has happened and i believe that this is a, a real work of god and we thank you for listening i hope you guys had fun and we hope to have karen on again very soon thank you so much have a wonderful morning afternoon or evening wherever you are in the world and have a strange and spiritual day everybody bye bye